Hi, everybody, and um, welcome to uh, the Screen Training Ireland um, Archives Masterclass uh, with Matthew Wader. Um, just that uh, you probably may not know this stuff over the festival, but I uh, just wanted to uh, thank Lance for coming uh, with the Archives again. He was here 11 years ago at the first ever festival. And um, we, you know, the theme for this year was Heroes, so I've watched Lance's. Um, Trailblaze uh, around the world with his amazing uh, films and uh, technological uh, imagine, technological imagination to sort of make his transmedia project. So, um, yeah, just wanted to welcome that and say thanks for coming over and I hope you enjoy the masterclass today and um, hopefully see you around later on. It's a big Halloween party on the Grand Social Day on this evening, so um, you're all welcome to come to that. Thanks. Thank you so much. to like driving film from my, at the time I lived in Philadelphia, driving film from shoots in Philadelphia to the labs in New York, and I'd sleep in my car and then bring the film back to the set. And you know, so they would have video dailies the next, uh, the next day. And then from there I, um, I started to, uh, I was a PA, and then I became a camera assistant and a camera operator. And I did that work um, all over the world, probably for about seven or eight years, and I had the great fortune of working with a, a number of really amazing cinematographers when they would leave feature films and come in and work on commercials because it was converting and it you know, bridge gap to what they were doing. So I was an assistant to um, Conrad Hall and Darius <coughs> Kanji and Harris Sidis and all these guys when they would uh, effectively come between feature films. And um, 
And then I directed and shot many music videos and, and did a lot of kind of, um, you know, crew work all the way through. Um, and one day, and I think I probably mentioned this yesterday, but for people that weren't here, uh, one day um, uh, you know, I was sitting in Penn Station in New York and I was flipping through a magazine and I saw this ad for a, a card that you could put into your computer, and that was in 1996. And I had never had a computer before. Um, and I thought, wow, that's a great reason to get a computer. I can get this card, and I can put it into the computer, and I actually can start to edit it. You know, now, that, now there's a reason to have a computer. So that kind of took me down this course of something I think has been very relevant within just my whole career is just uh, a, a degree of risk taking. You know, kind of jumping in to very deep water and not necessarily being sure what the results would be. So, with that project, um, which would become the last broadcast, uh, I made it with a friend, Stefan Avalos. Uh, Stefan had made a film, I guess probably around 1992, um, called The Game. Um, not to be confused with David Fincher's film, but um, made it for, I guess it was about $42,000. Sold it to a sales agent, or, well, sold it through a sales agent to a number of distributors, various territories all over the world, and then never saw reports and never saw any money from it. And around the same time, I was trying to raise money to make a film, a uh, Super 16 film. I raised like 30 grand. I was trying to raise 250,000 and ended up giving the money back. So we were both very kind of frustrated by the process. And so when I found that ad and that magazine, it felt like it was this degree of freedom, you know, like a, a chance to actually be able to make something. And so we, we set out and we just said, oh, you know what, why, why don't we see if we can make a movie for, it, it is, you know, for nothing, for as little as possible. So what we ended up doing was um, we ended up making a movie called The Last Broadcast, which played here in 1999, uh, and we made that film for um, $900. Now, granted, that doesn't take into consideration the, the time, the sweat equity, and the stuff that we put into it, but when we actually added up all the receipts that we had, you know, from what we didn't bank, borrow, and steal, it was, you know, uh, 800 and some. I, I rounded up and it was $900. So what was, what was kind of interesting about that project was, just from the get-go, it had no, no limitations to it, you know? Like we, we had total freedom with what we wanted to do. And we structured it in a way that we knew it would um, yield some degree of results. You know, we worked with what we had. We worked with the limitations that we were given. Um, so we would work with locations that we knew we could access, and we worked with people, and we, we conceived a, a format that we thought would be an interesting format. Um, and the format for that particular film involved um, a play on reality and you know what was fact, what was fiction. Was very much inspired by the time, like the O.J. Simpson trial, and also inspired by um, a really great film called David Holzman's Diary, which is an older, older film if anybody's seen it. Um, and so, the last broadcast tells the story about um, two public access uh, hosts. Do you guys have public access here in Ireland? It's like, um, uh, do you know what I mean by public yeah. access? Okay. They have this uh, paranormal variety show uh, called Fact or Fiction. And um, I was one of the actors in it, not because I wanted to act, but because I knew that I would show up and I knew that I would work inexpensively. And my, the, the other person that I co-directed and co-wrote it with was the other actors who were the hosts of this paranormal variety show. And so we get this viewer suggestion to do a story about the Jersey Devil, which is this folklore in, in, in New Jersey, uh, and the Pine Barrens, this amazing place, and you know, where there's like a million square acres of like pine trees, and this winged demon creature, rich mythology. You know, there are places when you travel through there that like the water bubbles up red, like blood, and it's just this like really backwards kind of bizarre place. And so um, the two hosts of the show take this viewer's viewer suggestion and they assemble a team, a paranormal sound recordist and a supposed psychic, and all of them go into the woods together to search for the Jersey Devil. 
and only one of them emerges alive, and he's blamed for the murders of the other three, and that's where we end with the story through the eyes of Dr. Mary Fulminger. Now, the last broadcast, which we started as a kind of a free, freeing ourselves from the process, is this crazy movie that you know goes on to have um, a weird uh, kind of relationship with a much larger, well, a film that we predated that then came out called The Blair Witch Project. So it has this whole weird history with that film. It goes on to become the first all digital release of a motion picture. And it, you know, it was just this little $900 film. And I think some of that ended up happening really because uh, you know, I did feel like we could just bury it in the backyard. You know? And what was interesting is when people came and, and we were offered you know, uh, studio deals for the film, um, I had already negotiated deals um, with various outlets that were totally outside the box. And for instance, when it came time to release that film, um, I, I had been reading about uh, this thing called digital projection, you know, DLP technology. It was like these chips that you could put into a, a computer. And I returned to that, um, you know, the idea of just being cold calling. You know, so I thought, well, we, we made this film, we don't want to blow it up. I just said, we made this movie, we don't want to blow it up to film. We don't want to spend thirty to $60,000. So we, um, we said, oh, well, there's this new thing called digital projection. And uh, there's uh, basically uh, you know, a, a freeing way to kind of release the work without having to incur the cost. So then we were like, well, how can we, how can we kind of release it in multiple cities? And I was like, oh, well, satellite. And I didn't know anything about satellite. But what I did was I sat down and I actually started faking extension numbers on the phone, you know, and called my way all the way through two different satellite companies until I got to the top of those companies. And then I pitted them against each other and uh, literally had them buy on to a, a kind of, it was almost like, I remember it was like this kind of drawing that we had of what we thought digital cinema could be and sold them on that concept. And literally, I'll never forget, I, I was on with my producer and we were on this call and, um, you know, uh, we were going through the, the call with the, the very, you know, the people who were on it from the, the one satellite company and they were totally obsessed with who else we were talking to. So every time they would come and they would breach that part of the conversation and they would say, you know, they would come back to a point of like, well, who are you talking to? I would, I would, I would uh, change the subject or I would say, uh, I'm sorry, we can't talk about that. And every time they kept, it just made them come back to it more. And then at a certain point, um, they said, um, they came back to the point and, and I said, um, I'm sorry, we have to go now. In, in the middle of this call, and, and I say, we're finished, we have to go. And so I hang up, and then my partner calls me. She says, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You know, we're right close to closing this thing. And I'm like, oh, I don't, just trust me, I think it's gonna work. And um, they, they ended up calling back, probably like an hour and a half, two hours later, a very long gap in time, it felt long. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I ended up, closing it for like a million and a half dollars. So it literally went from what was 85,000 to a million and a half just by that action of saying that we had to go off the phone. So what was interesting about that was, you know, I had no deal experience, I just kind of went from the gut and, um, you know, just took those risks. Um, and we really, what's ironic about it is the competitive aspect, a lot of it was positioning. You know, a lot of it was the classic thing, you know, somebody wants something that they think that they can't have. So, um, you know, that the movie went on to become the first all digital release, and what that actually meant was um, the film was actually beamed via a geosynchronous platform satellite, um, like 30 some thousand, whatever it is, is it sky, that is, is, I forget what the exact the distances, but then came back down through um, satellites, uh, you know, that were placed on top of the movie theaters, and then down onto uh, NT Windows NT systems that um, downloaded onto a hard drive and projected a digital projection. 
Um, now the projectors were a different story. You know, they rented for like ten thousand dollars. And by all means, I'm telling you these things not to make it seem like I'm <laughs> this is a funny story too. But not to make it seem like uh, well, yeah, okay. It, it, it's all about like the negotiation of certain things. This part of what I'm setting up is, but um, so we needed projectors, right? So I knew that multiple companies had them. And so I thought, well, this is an amazing cinematic first. I'm gonna write, um, I'm gonna write them letters and uh, you know, send them these emails or whatever and, and say, you know, this is a cinematic milestone. And I thought they'll all respond. Well, I sent out all these different letters and um, it was like crickets. You know, so now we have, we have the satellite park, we don't have the projectors. So, um, and uh, what, what I did was um, took the letters and addressed them to the competitors. You know, so like when I sent them, I left the name of the competitor on the letter and sent them all out to each of them and all of them called. And then we ended up with like a, a projector anywhere in the world we wanted it for two years. And initially all I was trying to do was get it for, you know, the, the run that we were doing. So um, once I got those projectors, um, Stefan and I started thinking, well, you know, we're democratizing the way that we're making these films. Let's see if we can take these projectors with us to various festivals and release the burden of having to make prints on, on filmmakers. And so we you know, introduced digital projection to um, you know, Sundance, and we did it at Cannes, and we, you know, we did it to all these regional festivals. We, we helped bring it to dark light. We, anywhere that we went, we just kind of brought the projectors and tried to turn people on to the fact that they could use them and could save money. And it sounds very logical now, but we met a huge resistance from film festivals and from filmmakers at the time. You know, we weren't considered real filmmakers because we didn't shoot on film. You know, we weren't considered, um, you know, we weren't taken legitimately for whatever reason at that time. And a lot of people felt like we were threatening the core of what it was to, to make films. Which is a recurring theme in my work. I think I'm always very disruptive, and, and I think a lot of it is is really kind of stems from that idea of just being able to have freedom, you know, to make the work that I want to make. You know, I think anybody who makes work in the room knows that the amount of time that you actually get behind the camera is so small in comparison to the process and the labor to get there. You know, and you're always trying to get back to that point. You know, from the moment that you sit down and you write and you imagine what this story could be to all the funding issues, the logistical issues, all the moving parts and pieces that it takes to, to actually create the work. And so the reason I wanted to start with that kind of that last broadcast story was um, because of the risk, you know, because of the risk and then taking risk but then willing to share it back in some way in an effort to try to help open it up, you know, to try to help change the way it is, um, which is a kind of a reoccurring theme of the work that I do. So the last broadcast went on to do that satellite release, and um, I kind of jokingly said this the other day when I was asked to say something before the start of Dark Light, um, and for the benefit of anybody that wasn't there that day, um, uh, you know, two, earlier this week my father phoned me up on the, on the phone and uh, said he was really, really excited. He said, you're on Jeopardy. And I said, well, what do you mean on Jeopardy? And he said, well, the last broadcast. Jeopardy. It's a question on Jeopardy. And uh, it was a $1,600 question. The person got it right. That's nice. Um, and it, it was all about literally being the first all digital release of a motion picture. But what's interesting about that is it took 11 years for it to really be recognized. And we, even though we did that, you know, there were all these other people that would come out, like you know, George Lucas and all these other studio things that would come out and say, you know, the first Hollywood film first, whatever, but uh, we were validated by Jeopardy in the end. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I guess what the reason I bring that up is just the point of like what it takes culturally sometimes for things to catch up, you know, and uh, still, you know, digital cinema struggles in terms of being fully implemented, you know, prints are still <laughs> in the United States and much of the world. So that one project, the last broadcast, when it came time to see the negotiating the deals, um, because we had been so free, you know, because we raised this money on a whim, on some crazy idea to release it via satellite, you 
know, we manufacture like all kinds of merchandise and different things and struck all these deals. You know, when we turned out the studio offers, we, we retained the rights to the work. And, uh, you know, to, to date, uh, the film's gone on to gross over $5 million worldwide. So we still own it and periodically release it. So, um, I wanted to kind of start there to give a context because a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is almost there's what I see as kind of a, a new window opening in terms of creative freedom and in terms of the ability to tell stories and you know, democratization of the tools, much of which we were talking about or, or helped to usher in with the film like the last broadcaster, are obviously more of a reality today. And um, the what, where I used to consider myself a filmmaker at one point, I don't anymore. And, uh, you know, I, I don't feel defined by one particular medium. Um, and so I found myself kind of gravitating towards um, uh, kind of calling it almost like story architecture. So what I'm going to share today is kind of like how I build some of these story worlds and what that means and uh, some of the scripting and the way that we design them, uh, you know, how we actually produce them, and uh, share uh, some of the stuff that I'm currently working on. So um, I want to walk you through, and by all means, if anybody has any questions, as you go through, you can let me know. Um, I'm going to start with um, basically um, when, when I sit down to kind of build a story world, what, what that means to me. Um, I had a, a really great experience recently at the Sunday Screenwriters Lab where um, what I loved about the program was it wasn't about technology, it wasn't about the production aspects, it wasn't about anything, it was, it was rooted very much in story, and it was almost like this pause button where you just kind of stopped and you had this opportunity to um, really concentrate on the story that you wanted to tell. And so, you know, I think what became apparent to me in, in both that process and just being at the forefront of doing things with technology or using technology creatively was that there are so many distractions that pull you from what a story is or what it is that you want to tell. So a lot of times I'll sit down and I'll kind of run through and ask myself these questions, you know, like what is the story about? You know, like what is that, what is that thing that is kind of um, driving it, you know, um, not from a plot perspective, but almost like a theme. Is there a certain theme that you're trying to mine with it? You know, um, why, why does the story, you know, what does it mean to you personally? And that's a really important part. Anybody that knows, you're going to be with the project for a period of time, so you, you should, at least I believe this, I mean, it's not always the case and you can't always do it, but you should feel very passionate about the work that you do. And uh, why does the story need to be told? You know, I think, I think I, and I spoke to this yesterday, I, I would argue that a lot of uh, projects are underdeveloped, you know, scripts are underdeveloped, films don't spend enough time in that phase developing themselves. Um, and I don't think they ask them, themselves why, uh, you know, why they need to tell that story. Uh, and then with transmedia, which is the concept of telling stories across multiple platforms, devices where characters can live and breathe away from one particular screen or medium, um, it's kind of like, where's the best place to tell the story? So I have projects now that are film driven, you know, uh, I have a large television series that I'm working on um, that you know is anchored around TV and has transmedia in and around it. And then I have things that don't have film or television, in them. and they're you know they might be an urban game, it might be an experience that I run as a social kind of social entertainment thing. It might involve social media. It might be run for the course of eight hours. Um, it's just all creative expression, and, and, and I'm always kind of wondering you know where's the best place to tell a story. So I kind of have this uh, theory that kind of work at like bullet point glass, and I spoke about this briefly yesterday, but I wanted to really hone in on it. With the, with the changes in authorship now, there's a real issue in terms of understanding because of media consumption changes and technology democratization, that it's a two-way conversation between you and the audience, and the audience is quickly evolving to become Collaborators, you know, I consider them to be collaborators, and so I say a bullet on glass because you know I have a singular vision for the story that I want to tell, 
and then where it cracks out is where I leave room for the audience um, to kind of step in and participate. And I really want, and I use glass as an analogy because I, I almost want it to break. You know, I want it to challenge me. Um, and like software, the development of software, you know, we often find that uh, you put it out to the public and they play around with it, they break it, and they give it back to you. So, but the interesting thing about where it cracks out is how can you actually create a two way conversation with an audience? And what does an audience actually expect? from the work that you're doing and how can you tell a story and make it resonate in terms of like where, where do you give away a certain degree of control and where do you retain the control? And that's always a balance and it's obviously the, you know, a decision that somebody who is working, you know, making the project has to decide for themselves. But I, I like the idea of the audience becoming a collaborator for a variety of reasons. You know, it has business implications but it also has a lot of exciting creative implications. So when I kind of sit down, and, and this was by Robert Pratt, who uh, writes for the Workbook Project, um, I, you know, I'll kind of run through, and he kind of summed this up in a very good way. You know, what is the story I want to tell? You know, kind of how will I deliver the story? Uh, what kind of audience participation do I want or need? Sometimes you don't need it. You don't need the audience to participate in every step of what you're doing. Uh, how will the audience participation affect the story over time? Uh, like, when are you going to bring them in? How much are you going to bring them in? And how much is it based in the real world versus the fictional world? Now, uh, a lot of the times, uh, some of the early transmedia work has been kind of rooted around hoax driven things or this desire to kind of create a hoax, you know, because people think it's an easy, kind of convenient way to suck people in. And, what, what's interesting is there, there aren't really clear writing definitions around transmedia or the best way to kind of write for transmedia. So there, there are certain conventions that kind of pop up because uh, if you look at, you know, if you're going to tell something that involves the internet or, or, or it involves mobile devices or it involves, um, you know, real world um, audience participation, uh, you're kind of always working trying to find uh, a balance when I know personally when I design these things, I look at it and I, I really want each of them to have a beginning, middle, and end. You know, um, so they have their own little arcs, you know, and they have their overall arc throughout the story. And I think um, that's very important because uh, um, you know, when, I, when I've done some of the work, I've found that you know, people respond to a feeling of some degree of completion or some you know, sense of reward or a sense of emotional connection to something. And the more that you string out the design and try to get people to move from one device to another to some, you know, I want to get them to watch the premiere of some show, or I want to get their ass into a seat to watch a theatrical, you know, presentation, the more challenging it becomes because the audience is, I would argue at this point, considerably smarter and collectively smarter than the industry is, and then that storytellers are. And storytellers are really to kind of step up. Kind of bridge that gap, in my opinion. So, a lot of the times when we when we sit down and we write, uh, we'll actually kind of create what's very similar to a series bible, Charlie Ray's Fortune Television. You know, we really drill it out. This is an example of Battlestar Galactica in the Bible. Um, and that'll have all kinds of things in terms of the you know really richness of like character development, uh, the rules of that particular world. Storylines, you know, season arcs, all kinds of things, and we'll marry that with a game design document or a game bible. And between the two, we'll create a story world bible for the project that we're working on. It gives us a rich idea of the atmosphere and uh, gives us a sense of the rules of that world, the characters. Now, anybody that's written in the room knows, you know, the degree of work that goes into the backstory of actually scripting something, you know, character development. All the things that don't necessarily make it into, you know, an outline or the treatment or the final script. But if you've done the homework and you've really written, there's a lot of backstory elements that you might have or that you might explore. Those things kind of make their way into it as well. So when we when we kind of build it, um, we look at it where it's a combination between things. This is for a, a new project that I have. It's a 
ten million dollar feature film or a two million dollar um, short movie project called uh, Hope Is Missing. Um, we usually break things down in the image book, which isn't too dissimilar to how other people probably will work through a, uh, a project. And if, if, if you don't do that, it's a really great way to kind of visualize it for other people in terms of the style. We'll you know we'll do all the backstory elements. You know, like uh, in this particular case, the story is kind of a Lord of the Flies tale about a strange kind of sleep virus that leaves all the adults infected and, and soon they disappear and it leaves all the youth to their own devices. Um, but you know we'll do things where we'll say, okay, the character, you know, what's the what what was the, you know what was the character doing at this particular point? Um, what are they guilty about when the when the world changes? You know, all these kind of backstory elements, the relationships, you know, where they felt, you know, they, they fit in and, and all those things are very important because when you kind of hit the ground running with a story like this, um, people need to know what those past relationships are, you know, because it really mines the conflict and, 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 and a lot of the, the dramatic elements that come into play. And then we'll do a lot of kind of uh, flow documents and interactive kind of charting, which is similar to if anybody's ever worked on either you know, console game development or interactive site development. And we'll do a lot of mind mapping one down here that's a little hard to see is uh, kind of maps out the whole story of the world. You know, breaks it off into platforms, breaks it off into um, various thematics, and, uh, and then it gets into more detail up here where it breaks it into certain parts. And I'll walk us through um, what effectively is, is the one interactive leg of this project. Now, uh, I thought this was a really cool diagram because what you have here is um, kind of a charting across time and space, all the different intersections of characters across these different properties, uh, different films, you know, like a linear path with something like 12 Angry Men and then Primer's kind of crazy because they're, they keep encountering themselves and they come back and forth and then you look at something that's really like Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings, which are very much like heroes' journeys, you look at these really amazing intricate cross sections of characters over time. And what's really exciting about you know, kind of the idea of telling stories with transmedia is if you kind of look at these, and the reason I like them is you start to see that there's all these travels or different things that are happening that happen away from the format that we're locked in. You know, when you write a script, it's a three-act structure usually, it's a certain running time. In television, it's locked in a certain way. And you know, there's all these other different possibilities, because in, in, in a lot of ways, um, they're missed. I mean, that's what's great about literature. You can, you can come in and go into it in your mind. And Lord of the Rings is obviously an amazing work, because it's so dense. Um, so when we started to look at the scripting of these things, and you have such dense properties, uh, and you have so much that you want to kind of write, you know, we, we start with like effectively that story world Bible. But then it becomes really about a filtering process. It becomes like, okay, what's going to make its way into either the pilot script that we're doing for television or into the feature film script? Um, or whatever the script is that is going to be one part of or anchoring the project. And right now, television and film anchor these projects just because we're still in a point where traditional media funding and so forth is usually anchored around a, a property like that. So, what we kind of looked at, and one of the things that I found was, we, you know, when we went to the Sunday Ice Cream Writers Lab, one of the takeaways was we had built such an incredibly rich world that we were putting so much into that script that it really became about the filtering process when we kind of stepped away. And so um, we, would, we had used the Story World Bible to help filter to write the script, but then there was such a, such a dense world within it that we needed to kind of step back and filter ourselves even more. And what I started to realize is that the, the screenwriting, um, there's limitations in terms of the way that you can actually script, you know. Um, and we started to kind of work with an annotation scheme to help the other people that were part of the process to understand when a transmedia element was going to intersect with the traditional narrative and what we were doing. And so I've since sat down with you know, people at the Writers Guild and different organizations to talk about like how we could create an annotation scheme for it so it was an easier way to kind of communicate it and move through it. So in this particular example, 
Uh, we have parallel paths, you know, when the protagonist kind of walks into the school, there's a trigger, there's like a when event, and there's a subsequent kind of um, action that comes off of that. And uh, just by kind of annotating that within the script, we're able to start to look and, you know, and, and be able to break it out, similar to what, you know, an AD would do when they would break out the script and say, you know, here are the locations, here are the characters, this is what's needed. Um, and a lot of the transmedia stuff is really challenging right now because there, there really isn't anything in place. So a lot of this is kind of going through and kind of working it as a trial and error. And uh, there's some really great, uh, a lot of really great kind of uh, work and sharing that's being done by various practitioners within the space. So um, this weighing condition, for instance, when we step through it, um, responds to the events that occur in the story world or related stories. And related stories can mean like, it could be a, a character, uh, it could be pushed off and related to a theme, uh, a motif, a anything. I mean, that's the beauty of it. Um, and, and basically, um, so when Sebastian enters the school, we have these different elements that activate, you know. Um, so, uh, and, and, and quite simply, in this instance, when he goes into the school, in the story, there's a certain thing that happens, but the school is kind of a win event, like, when that character intersects with that location, that then will trigger a subsequent kind of story path where we have it working across mobile and there's a whole bunch of mobile content that we're doing. So in this particular instance, it's signifying a path from one format to, the, to another. You know, what it, <coughs> sure, um, basically in this particular scene, when he, when he walks into the he walks into the school, he encounters um, within the, the story um, when all the adults disappear, they leave behind these totems. And the totems hold like a personal object that, that's of interest to an individual, to the youth. And uh, the adults exhibit these high mind like abilities, right? So when anybody ever picks up one of these objects, they, they're, they're kind of sucked into this like euphoric kind of state. And the high mind uses it. A way to manipulate them. So in this particular instance, when he walks into the school, there's a subsequent trigger that, that, that in one path in the film he finds whatever this totem is. When he holds that totem, it takes back to a, a memory that he has, and then that memory jumps off into that event, you know, which then plays out across like mobile. So we have serialized content. So if I step back for a second, um, the timeline of the story starts with global outbreak. So the serialized content, which we received funding from media to do, and verify business partners from Europe, um, is all serialized, right? So we received funding to do content in London and Berlin and Paris and Barcelona and, uh, and uh, I'm forgetting one, one place, but um, that content is all told from people in those territories by directors from those territories, actors from those territories. And um, effectively, that content sits in the timeline when the outbreak first starts. The feature film starts 90 days into that potential outbreak. So in this particular example, when he walks into the school, he encounters this totem. The totem transports him. When it transports him very simply, takes him back to a different time, pushes that part into serialized content, which is telling that story from where he is and he relates to him that way. So that's like kind of the timeline of it. Um, so in, in that instance, what we started to find was like, okay, if you're doing mobile content that's going to be serialized in some way and then you have narrative, that's a very simple example, but what happens when you start to get into characters who aren't necessarily in your main narrative script, you know, your traditional script? And that's when we started to get into the the idea of the annotation because that when event might trigger a totally subsequent story by somebody else, somewhere else in the world, but the, the common universal theme of something that they hold in that memory that they have or the way that society, uh, society has certain you know, things that are just culturally baked in that are universal. And so that was kind of the, the way that we kind of started to break away from that because you know, to kind of design where you have so many different narratives and so many different paths, like the way I showed literally the, the, the character diagram, you know, you have to have kind of an idea of like, okay, where's that kind of action from and how does
as it relates to the, in this particular instance, the main property, which we'll say is the feature. Can I say this? Sure. This scenario, when you pick up the phone, when you just come forward to the phone, when someone else contacts the phone, the mobile yeah. platforms, how do they, do they only have two options to pick up the phone? Do they know something that just got on into the platforms now? Or? Yeah, well, I think like it, it, it works in a couple of different ways. It works as a total standalone. And then it worked, like I'm really into this idea of the breadcrumbs, you know, like hopefully if I design um, a part so it's strong and has a good beginning, middle, and end within it, you know, like if the mobile episodes are compelling or, or whatnot, then it'll drive. But some of the, some of the hooks are done through uh, programmatically, meaning through software and different things that you need to, to kind of connect it so it's a passive experience. So you might move through it and it'll, it'll help push you to the next part. And then there are other parts where you can actively just search it out. So we kind of try to design it uh, most effectively from the emotional core of it. So behaviorally, hopefully something will respond to it and feel like it's a strong story point. Um, but we also work to, uh, to write it in so it triggers. And that, that, that could simply mean um, you know, when we get to a certain sequence within the, the, the actual mobile content, depending upon the, the wrap of the I'll just get technical for a second. Dependent upon um, like some of the mobile development that we're doing actually will run within an app. So the video will be presented to an app. It knows when the video gets to a certain part within the timeline and then will trigger an event somewhere else within the story and help move somebody to that next point. So people can move independently or we will help guide them through the experience. So, um, I want to talk uh, about what we put into a story world Bible because I think it'll it'll Sorry, help. Yes. So when you say if this film seen a uh, in a cinema and was available on your on your uh, iPhone at the same time, yeah. you watch it on the iPhone and it's totally constant an animation film is totally on something, and then you choose whether to watch something more than other, you know what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. What other experiences have you seen in the movie? Yeah. In the movie theater. Yeah, you could do it like it's intended either way. Like it's intended that maybe somebody only ever sees the serialized content or they see the movie and, and it's built. So it, it works as an independent experience. But then what we're, excuse me, what I'm very interested in is the bridges. You know, like how can I make those bridges work? You know, like what you have bridge between scenes. Like how can I actually make a bridge between devices? Because all we're really talking about is those bridges. Like how do you bridge between a device or a platform? Is really the core of it, you know. So, like, when you take into the way that you bridge scenes, I'm just looking and saying, okay, how can I actually bridge across, you know, devices, across screens, across you know these different types of uh, ways that people are consuming. Um, but a lot of that is kind of driven by uh, some of the elements that we put into the story world bible, you know. So when we're kind of looking at it, and what's exciting is. All the different things, like when I was talking about the homework that you would do when you would write, that maybe you discard, some of those things will make their way back. And, and I'll just kind of walk through these. Um, you know, there might be dialogue uh, that we play with that we like thematically, um, that maybe, and in the case of this story, because it deals with these totems and kind of this intoxication, there's certain dialogue that repeats through different things and has meaning because when they hold this thing, the hive mind talks to them in a certain way and manipulates them, right? So then that dialogue can be used by different characters in different contexts and in different places. Um, so that's one instance. Or there might be just dialogue that we like that we want to put into the Bible to help it more you know. There are various settings you where know, we set a, you know, set a scene, um, props. Um, in fact, one of the examples I'll give you specifically today involves the idea of props. Um, you know, events. And those are events that happen not only within the story, but similar to what I just described, you know, an event that happens within the story, but they can also be events in the real world. And I'll, I'll describe an example of that in this one. Uh, themes, which people are, is a very important part. Motifs, which are really great you know, in terms of using music, color, or different things that help kind of evoke a feeling. You know, various characters, and obviously the locations. The, the example I want to go through is uh, makes use of these core four elements. Uh, props, themes, motif, and setting. Um, now, this uh, 
example kind of, and I showed this slide yesterday, but I think it's relevant for this. This, this next example in a lot of transmedia brings up a conversation of like, okay, well, what's the difference between you know, passive viewing, lean back, people who actually want to participate in play, and then people who are like so into it that they're gonna actually contribute back to it. And uh, yesterday I argued that these numbers will increase, you know, where people in the passive will move into the players and producers when storytellers are able to more effectively let them know how to participate. Because right now storytellers don't do that effectively because the, the language is being shaped and this is all relatively new. But uh, what this next example is designed to do is when I talked about that bowl of warm glass, this next example is going to show how it leaves room for the audience to participate and become collaborators in the experience. And it'll show how the, these numbers start to change in terms of the way that people might be passive within the experience, but then they actually become players. So this, this part is called um, pandemic, and it, it is a companion to what was missing. And one of the things that I'm, I'm very interested in is how can I put people into the shoes of the protagonists? Um, and so in this particular example, we built um, an app on Android that allows people to kind of step into the shoes of the protagonist. So if I come into here and just give a sense of Pandemic's build, you'll see that Pandemic consists of four core elements. Uh, social games, uh, which might be casual games. Uh, you know, they, they might be something that uh, you know, might be app driven, like I'm about to show. Um, or they might be um, you know, uh, casual games, like a suite of casual games that actually could be online. So they might be on a mobile device, or they might be online, or they might even be in the real world. Um, serialized content, as I described to you guys. Um, live events, and I'll give an example for anybody that wasn't here yesterday of a live event uh, that we've done in the past. And then we have an element where we take all the serialized content in this particular instance, and we do kind of a global remix of it. Now, global remix will be used for broadcast licensing of that content, but it will also be used in certain uh, live event contexts when people make their way to the feature film. We're going to do these large audio video remixes of all the different perspectives from all over the world. So as they make their way in, we'll have these large screen projections, and I've done a lot of work in, in that space, you know, things where you're doing video mapping and so forth and so on. Um, and then we have the feature film. What, what's of note is, you know when I talked about the story world Bible before, and then it being a filter towards the script, we actually wrote the, did the story world Bible, then wrote the what effectively was the sequel to Hope is Missing, and then wrote Hope is Missing. So we had the full idea of how the arc of the, what the story was. And then Pandemic will be used effectively to, to trigger and use it as an R&D method to determine what you know, a third film might be. So in this particular instance, this is the interactive side of the design of what we're doing. Um, and if I kind of break it down, the serialized content, which I described earlier, is playing out initially in those, those uh, countries. Uh, we have a, a pretty cool kind of casual game suite that involves um, a couple um, core thematics, um, like the idea of how uh, within the story of the film, protagonist is kind of working to try to figure out what's happening and trying to kind of come to an understanding of what what's a, the affliction the adults are suffering from. And so he does, um, you know, like his version of certain science within it. Um, and so we, we kind of play off of that idea within some of the casual games that we do. Um, then we have uh, some live events that we're going to make use of, uh, the involvement of social media and a survival strategy kind of game, which I'll share with you when I get to the app. Uh, there's a level of social engagement that comes back through, um, and I'll explain how that works. And then, um, yes? Social media, is that like Facebook? Yeah, social media would imply uh, things like Twitter, Facebook, uh, maybe uh, video sharing sites you know, like YouTube or Vimeo, uh, social bookmarking sites you know, like Delicious. And uh, the social media kind of really ends up engulfing not only this, but a lot of the other parts of the transmedia planner. But for today's, at least initial, I want to kind of drive home a point of how the story 
impacts and, and leads what we do with the creative um, and, and what that means to be creative with a technology. Um, so I'm going to step into one part that is about um, using the, the mobile. Now, when I said pandemic, we built a mobile app for it. Um, I'm going to play down something so you can see, so everybody can kind of see this. Um, and I'm going to talk through it. It's, it actually has my voice on it, but instead of making you it's just weird, I'm standing up here and my voice is talking on the screen. But, um, so, whoops, sorry. I decided to start with Android just because it was an easier platform for us to rapidly prototype on. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, so okay. So, within this example, uh, pandemic started with Android, but uh, we'll eventually port it to the iPhone and the iPad. And the idea is that we want to put people in the shoes of the protagonist, right? So we have them out scavenging for supplies, looking for other survivors, and then when night falls, they need to make shelter for themselves. So in the story, uh, the adults come back and plague them at night. So um, I wanted to find a way that we could kind of create that. And we started by um, basically turning this into a four-part thing. It's hard to see this, but I'll explain. One's a map view, one's an augmented view, profiles and inventory. And within the story, um, totems have such significance, and mobile devices are very much like totems. So thematically, this rooted one of the core themes of the film. So when you see the mapping, it ties into Google Maps, and what we're going to do here is these areas are infected areas of hives. And each time I refresh, the game space, each of these little markers represents a space that somebody's created. We have over 50,000 people who are in the beta for it. What you're going to see is one nest that was created by an individual. And what that basically means is when they, when they actually make the nest, um, the, the nest is made in a way where they can take their phone, we wrote, wrote software that allows people to shoot a 360 around the space that they're in, shoot the floor and shoot the ceiling. And then what we do is we tie it to the compass of the phone. So wherever they move, it moves as though they're in that space. Uh, since this is on a mount, I couldn't do it. So you'll just see me moving through it with my, with my finger. All these little things on top are actually augmented reality elements. So there are different things that players can actually pick up and things that players can leave for each other in a space. So um, as I pick up uh, what I believe is going to be the video cassette, What's really kind of cool about this is you can, have, you can leave story elements in the real world. So you can assign video, audio, uh, stills to a certain geographical location. And I'm going to show here that the videotape that I picked up actually is related to that place, but it, it, you know, it was contributed by a user, and it's their interpretation of what the space looked like at some point before. So now spaces can have whole histories, they can have stories, they can have characters that live there. And each item that somebody picks up within the story has a whole history to it. So you can see who held it, when they held it. And one of the game mechanics is it encourages people to trade things with other people. So uh, it's a social element. You can only carry so much, but then the more you kind of get into the game, then maybe you come across a backpack, or maybe you find a car, and then you're encouraged to work with other people. Through it. This phase shows an augmented reality layer where you can actually go into a space and leave things for other people. You know, so I could come here to this space, leave something at the film base that the only way that you would ever get to it is if you came to film base. So the thing with the mobile that was very important to us was the ability to make it social. So in this particular instance, I'm showing how you can share out, you know, what you found across Twitter 
across Facebook. And what's really neat is you can actually affect what's in the game just by doing, you can do a special tag within Twitter that'll then populate things in the game. So people who aren't even using the mobile app can actually participate and leave things in the game world for people. Did you guys catch that? So I think it's a relevant kind of significant thing. It means that you have multiple points of entry. Um, and uh, so pandemic is, is, is very much, you know, like the important part of it is it really drills off the, the theme of the, of the actual story. So, you know, just to kind of hit on that again, because it, it's using, it's a prop, right? It's using the film, which is totems. It plays off the theme of the danger of objects. Right now, arguably, um, mobile devices are totems. They hold memories in the cloud. They hold photographs. They hold music. They hold all kinds of things for people. So you know that also feeds into that kind of that idea of the motif. And then the settings are dictated by where somebody happens to be. So we give relevance to a setting, give it a context, so it can have a story, it can have a history. So um, I think what what that particular example shows, and to get back to that bowl of long glass, is at this point we have um, uh, over 50,000 people who are in the closed beta. Uh, they've created about 3,000 spaces or more. Um, and uh, those spaces represent uh, uh, kind of the user generated side. You know, people are able to kind of just take their phone and shoot around them. And, and create a space that they're interested in. <laughs> now, with 3,000 spaces, it's not like we require somebody to go through every single space. The way that we're doing it is we're letting people be able to create, and then the spaces that are either the most traveled, or the spaces that are either the most customized, or have interesting stories, will then rise up. And then we'll feature those spaces. But then there's a discovery method where you can just kind of go out and find the others. So there's an inherent kind of design that we have in there where we're encouraging social interactions so people introduce those spaces to each other. And then there's elements where um, the more the time that they spend within it, um, then the, the more that it's likely to bubble up. So that's kind of an example of like, okay, we have a singular vision that the, the mobile app plays off of the theme, of the danger of objects, plays off of this motif of a totem, is uh, this, this, this thing is used within the story world by the adults to manipulate the youth. And uh, we use that as a game element that kind of hits on a number of different beats there. But what it also, Sorry, yes? It's just this round, the silver and silver film is The story in terms of the feature film story or the story yeah, in terms of the, the theme? Well, the story is pushed through you, when you saw the little objects. It's pushed through the discovery of certain things that we place in there. Yeah, so the history of the various places become history of where maybe some of our characters have been. Uh, the objects become things that might have been objects that they held that had some significance to them. So it becomes this device where we have infinite possibilities to lay in not only you know, the theme of what we're trying to do, but characters and stories, and, and be able to place them in a way that people will encounter them by going out into the real world, you know, so like we might be here, but effectively what this is doing is, is kind of creating a massive multiplayer game that's on a mobile device that has a social side, but then it's virtualizing the real world. So it's requiring people to go out and actually socialize with each other in real spaces, but then it's also providing value back where those people are, are kind of helping to build the actual game space. They're actually helping to crowdsource those the room, the nests that are made, then become other places that people can go. So the development is kind of designed so it builds out in an organic way, so it can be customized by people. But if you wanted to work with just the story of the game, the original story that the feature film and the people can interact with that, is there a capability of having alternate stories that people choose where they Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done it so much in a, like a choose your own adventure kind of way. We've done it more in a very, um, in a way that the story will kind of weave its way into the natural paths of where they go. And the characters will be teased to them in some way. I think it's kind of effective if they happen to keep encountering this character Sebastian and items that Sebastian has left places. 
they come to realize over time that Sebastian has some particular role within this greater context. You know, so it's a way to kind of suck people in. You know, it's kind of like when you write a, when you, you know, you foreshadow a thing. But just a simple example, like, oh, there's a gun on the table. Well, I know at a certain point that gun is going to be used in some way. It's going to have some pivotal thing. We're just kind of taking that and transposing it into a mobile device. So it doesn't even step on it. If anything, it just enriches who those characters are. So when you go in, you actually have some connection with the character more so than you would, I could ever write. You know what I mean? Unless I wrote a novel or something. You know, so um, so I don't necessarily see that as, as so much of a threat. It's all in how you kind of design. You know, like I mean, this design is very specific to make sure, like as I mentioned, the timelines. You know, outbreak, ninety days later, film tease who these people are in the outbreak, the universal quality of like, oh my god, what's going on in the world, into like, drill down, here's one place, 90 days, now how are they surviving? You know, so it, it won't necessarily step on. It'll, the goal is to enrich that world so much and create possibility that when we drill down, for the people who have spent the time with some of the other materials, it's richer, but for the people who step into the film, it's rich as well. It's a very, it's a very ambitious, very uh, you know, large project, and I think part of the reason that I started with that story about the last broadcast is that project took me six years. You know, so I, I think like this project has various elements where it's it's large, but then it's also scaled in in a, in a manner of like when we go and do the mobilized content. One of the things I was very interested in is can I actually treat that like co-production? You know, in those territories, can I format transmedia? And, like the way television formats and drop it into a territory and have somebody work from the story world Bible that I have, it's very similar to a series Bible, and then they can action on, you know, within that stylized guide content. So that's how we're doing it in different countries. So the mobile content will actually be, will, will be, is, is being made and will continue to be made by people who are helping to uh, work from a vision that we have. In terms of the filtering to the audience, um, and I'm going to get to this in a few minutes, um, we use data and we use programming 
towels and filter. You know, so similar like if you have uh, recommendation engines towards like you, you like this, you might like that. We look at the data points and, 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 and work to try to connect people of similar interests within the story. So there's certain things that we're doing programming, you know, from a programming perspective to help you do that. Um, but it, you know, I won't sit here and tell you that it's not an ambitious project or that it won't take a lot of effort or hasn't taken a lot of effort so far. But I think any time that you're kind of working in a new space, you're kind of taxed with like, how do you actually develop this thing? You know, how do you operationalize these aspects of it? You know, how do you staff it? How do you budget it? So a lot of that really kind of comes, it's like um, within software, there's a, there's a process where you're always kind of um, designing and testing, designing and testing, designing and testing, and, and, and hopefully refining as you go. So you know, we're kind of making use of some of those, those aspects. Um, it's a wide range. You know, we have uh, 18 to 25 year old males, but then we also have you know, um, mothers who have multiple kids, and you know, we have older people. It, it just depends, and it, it breaks down. And I'll show in a few moments, like the spread of it, um, which I think I'll answer that. so we make sure it matches tonally and it's consistent. Um, some of it will be working back from what we think the release structure will be, you know, like where we think we'll release, who our partners are, and from a territory by territory basis, you know, in this case, you know, this project is, is has elements that will be day and date that are live, event, but then elements that will be released over time dependent on the territory that they're in. So kind of look at the release structure of it. And then what you'll do is you'll kind of um, Using that style guide, drop it into a territory, find you know co-producers that you work with. On the software side, we'll usually start the software in advance. You know, we'll build that out, the spec, we'll work through like the way I demonstrated yeah. the Android, where Android comes at a point where um, it actually came before we uh, fully engaged and started doing the serialized content. And we've started doing the serialized content now, but the you know so it went story world, Bible, script. Into uh, into the instance of where we um, we uh, then started app development, app development into a serialized content in this particular instance, you know, and then it kind of repeats itself. So then the app development once it locks into a territory, it will come back and start to be done and you know, kind of continues like that. Um, okay. So to answer your question in terms of the demographics, what's really wild about this? is when people opt in to the app um, and to the beta, closed beta that we're doing, um, they give us a variety of data points. And um, we're very transparent about how we use it. It's very clear. It's meant for R&D purposes. We're not selling people the data. It's all uh, anonymized in a lot of ways. But this represents the use of the app over like a two hour period on one particular day. So all these spaces are people actually creating nests. So you can see the spread of where they are. You, what, we, what we do is kind of this idea towards contextual storytelling, where that data that we collect, we then use to enhance the experience. So what that means is like, at this point we have uh, over 50,000 downloads and we just recently crossed 3,000 spaces. The data collected is you know, GPS data, uh, make and model of a handset 
the operating system of the phone, uh, email address, phone number, and the amount of times that we use it. I think that in a lot of ways, what's really exciting about that is, yes, it could have all kinds of marketing and promotion aspect, but what we're really driven by is how can the contextual storytelling start to connect people to each other in really interesting social ways, you know, so that they can start to, like I have this theory, um, if people are familiar with the idea of a social graph, like right now, your friends on Facebook, your friends on Twitter, or, or whatever platforms you use in the digital space, if you do, they form your social graph. I'm very interested in when we get to a media social graph, where all of a sudden, you know, we could be uh, introducing each other to these interesting, uh, it could be music, it could be books, it could be um, you know, other films, referential things, you know, this is related to this, this is related to that, and how story will help to drive those things. Because in the future, story is going to drive social networking. Story is going to drive app development. And it's a really, as I said yesterday, a wonderful time to do storytelling. But those data points very simply help us to show where interest resides, you know, who potentially those, those people are, and then helps us to push and customize and personalize certain aspects of the story you know, based on where somebody might be geographically. Um, a lot of data that's great about it is you can just take it and reinterpret it. So we can use it, the data that we collect on a mobile device, we can use it to inform and create an interface that works online. You know, where television is headed right now, the same thing will be true within the living room. So in a lot of ways, some of the things that we work to is this idea of story detection, you know, where you kind of go and you start maybe on your mobile device or on, in your living room or on your online, but wherever you go, the story knows where you were last and picks up from where you, you left off and then introduces you to other people, if you choose to, who are involved in that part of the story as well. Um, you know, and then we have the mobile apps, like I just showed you, that's one particular app that we're doing. And then we have a number of browser plugins, which are just enhancements to a, a browser environment. Yeah, definitely. It, it's not, you know, transmedia isn't a new concept. You know, I, I mean, I could point to Catholicism and just demonstrate it through Catholicism. It's all there. It's like when you have iconic images or certain characters or certain things that are interpreted in different languages in different ways. It might be stained glass windows, it might be a statue, it might be a, 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 a passage of religious text in different versions. You know, you know religion is a great example for that. But um, in terms of heroes, in terms of comic books, comic books are, it's not uncommon to have characters move from one world into another world, and you see it with bad television, you know, where you have spin-offs from one series to another series. Not all of them are bad, but a lot of them are bad. Um, and, uh, you know, things along those lines. So when we, when we look at a, a story world Bible, these are some of the things that we put into a Bible. Um, you have all the stuff that kind of comes from the homework of kind of writing, you know, what are the motivations of these characters, what makes them who they are, what are the arcs of those characters, you know, how do they, how, in some way, how do they change, or how do these situations change those characters. Uh, the backstories, you know, the real, uh, you know, which might involve the relationships, it might just involve, like, the minutia of who they are. Um, you know, uh, various notes that we have, dialogue, as I mentioned before, and experiences, you know, what has made that character, uh, you know, the way they are, at least in our minds, how, what do we think has shaped that character? Uh, then we'll do various things around, like the script annotation, which I talked about, uh, flow documents, which are just, uh, you know, visual representations of the world that we're creating, uh, mind maps, which are a similar visual thing, and we'll do a lot with, like, points of entry, you know, like the, the description of what I described with mobile, if somebody comes into the mobile experience, how then do they move to another point within the story, which was a question that was asked earlier. So, um, so we'll look and, and craft those points of entry because then you can start to weave, like when you craft a scene or, or a, a sequence of scenes, you're, you're kind of taking a point of view and pushing somebody in a certain way. So we'll look at the points of entry in a way that we can enhance that. You know, is there a certain path that somebody goes down? It's a certain character that we choose to follow. 
programmatically do we find that they follow that character more than another character, then that helps us serve up different things to them. And then in terms of the game stuff, we'll look at different types of games. Um, uh, Role-playing games, for instance, um, you know, might have an element of that. Might have an element of social games, which are intended for people to be more interactive with each other in some social context. Puzzle-based, um, which is pretty obvious. Alternate reality games, which might extend more into the real world in, in some particular way. How, how many people were here yesterday when I spoke? Okay, I'm going to give a really quick example that's like a live event into kind of an example of an alternate reality game. Quickly, and for anybody that heard it yesterday, it's going to sound pretty similar to what I said yesterday, so I apologize. Um, I had a film called uh, Head Trauma, my second feature film. $126,000 shot over like a 90 day period. Um, you know, because you always kind of trick yourself into making something. You're like, oh, we'll make this in like 28 days, and then it kind of pulls in whatever. But um, in that particular instance, uh, Head Trauma had been released on, on um, I had done a self-distribution of 17 city theatrical, took it to DVD, and then decided I wanted to recontextualize certain aspects of it. And I experimented with that project, and a lot of those learnings have informed what we're doing now, because we take a lot of the, those learnings and both share them, but then also kind of, you know, um, very, we're very driven by practical, you know, like testing things and, and trying to, to improve the process that we use. So, uh, with head trauma, when I took it back out and recontextualized it, that story is about a guy who comes back home after 20 years um, to stay at his grandmother's house. She's passed away. He's kind of like this transient drifter. Comes back and decides he's going to stay there. Uh, falls and strikes his head while he's trying to save it from being condemned. And he's trying to clean it out. And he starts to have these recurring nightmares. And slowly but surely, his nightmares start to cross over to his reality. So in that particular story, it's kind of a psychological so when people came to see the screening of the movie, we booked it into um, alternate venues like museums, um, universities. And it worked out well, ironically. It, it performed better than the theatrical release, higher ticket prices, minimum guarantees. It was just better from a business perspective. So when they actually made their way to the theater, we wrote software that rang the pay phones up and down the block. So when they picked up the payphone, they would hear like this weird fragmented conversation that was foreshadowing some element within the film. They come around the corner and they encounter like a street preacher. Well, that street preacher was an actor from the movie, and uh, he was preaching fire and brimstone. He was handing out these crazy small religious comics, you know, propaganda comics. So when somebody took them, if you held them up to the light, there were all these codes and ciphers within the pages of them, right? And um, on the back it said, "Do you want to play a game?" So when they made their way into the actual theater to watch the movie, the movie was rescored live by musicians and DJs. Characters emerged from the audience and actually scared people. And then um, we wrote software that allowed people to interact with the film via the mobile phone. So we encouraged them to leave their phones on. We put up a sign that said, you know, whatever you do, do not call this number, do not call it, it's dangerous, do not call it. And of course, everybody called it. Um, and then, um, during the movie, we pushed a meta-narrative to them, right? And so uh, they would receive text messages, phone calls uh, from characters that were pushing like a, a separate story effectively to them that was foreshadowing elements of what they would see and then what would happen later. And then uh, we actually even started to interconnect people in the audience to each other. And when we did that, certain things were placed on phones that people then had to find the other person who had the phone and it became this really cool social thing afterwards and people got to meet each other. Um, and then what was really kind of cool, and um, it may be a little bit creepy, but it is a psychological horror film, the movie would follow you home, right? So when you, uh, when you went online, you started to, you said, oh, wow, well, look, it says you want to play a game. There's a website, you know, headtraumamovie.com. So you went there, and all of a sudden you realized that that comic was actually a full-on interactive comic. And you started to move through it, and there's all these things that are hidden within it. It's very much themed like the film. And then all of a sudden your phone rings. You know, you answer your phone, and it's all sound designed and, and built to scale, and it's the nemesis from the movie that you've seen. And he starts asking you these questions, similar to what the protagonist went through in the film. And uh, you know, you know, do you feel guilty? You know, and um, 
things like that, whatever your verbal response back is, it launches video and audio on the screen and starts moving you through an experience. And at a certain point, the nemesis says, you know, tell me something dark about yourself that nobody knows, because, and this is a spoiler, because in the film, the nemesis is, is in fact, you know, it's all about repressing it, it is in fact his subconscious, and so forth and so on. So whatever that person says into the phone, when they're, when they're asked that question, it's, um, we captured the audio from their phone and looped it back over the computer speakers, right? Mm -hmm. So now they hear themselves saying this dark secret or whatever it is, whatever they said into the phone at that time, and it's freaking them out, right? So then they're clicking, 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 trying to close, and we built like a fake exit box. <laughs> and as they hit that, we know it, and then the character says, you know, where do you, where do you think you're going? You're not finished yet. <laughs> at, at which point, drops them into conversations with all the other people that are experiencing that at the same time. So, you know, you see like a, a really cool arc there, you know, where you have like communal experience to a mobile device, to online, back to a communal experience again. So that's an example of like an alternate reality game. That's an example of what I mean by live event that, that involves technology and it also pushes and drives the story. Yes. I hate to ask a, a, a boring question. Do you have any giggles about that? Any legal concerns about Oh, well, people opted in to the experience. Okay. So it's all it's all like an opt-in, double opt-in process. Okay. At any point, they can exit. And, yeah. So it's all like, yes, yes. So to answer your legal question, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so that's an example of an alternate reality game. In the case of, uh, you know, you usually look and say, are these collaborative or competitive games that we want to do? Uh, are there reward or conflicts? You know, are there win or lose? Not every game has to have a win-lose component that can be continuous play. Um, you know, and then uh, are they live or scripted characters? In the case of what I just described to you, you know, we had live characters on the street, then we had scripted characters that were prompted through phone interactions. Uh, you know, what will the players do? This is really important. Um, you know, uh, okay, and this is also important. Why is it fun? You know, why is that fun? And then the replayability is that constant challenge. How can you make it so it's replayable? So somebody will be able to come in. And then how will they be able to come in at any time, no matter where it starts? So those are all very important aspects. These are six tips that took me a very long time to figure out. Um, some of them might seem very obvious, but it takes time. Um, take, the, you know, take the time to evaluate the story you want to tell. Uh, and what I mean by that is, as I mentioned earlier, um, stories are vastly underdeveloped. And as much as transmedia immediately right now in the category is all about like promotion and marketing and audience building, there are two camps currently that are kind of pushing. Like I, I, I'm very much in the, in the side of pushing story and using transmedia as a way to develop stories, engage audiences through story, not necessarily shoehorning onto a property and have it be a promotion or marketing thing. So I use transmedia a lot of the time to help develop concepts to use it as a way of R&D storytelling and, and use it as a way to kind of inform the stories that I want to tell. But you know, ask yourself uh, hard questions. You know, well, why will anyone care about the story that you're trying to tell them? And, uh, and then also, is this the best way to tell this story? Let go of a single point of view. Um, it's very common to look at design and anchor yourself just in the point of view of your protagonist or very literally characters that are in one particular property. That desire to say, OK, we're now going to see it always from that character's perspective, or now we're just going to see it uh, in some way uh, from you know just the people who are in the film, like the example I gave with the mobile breaks that entirely. You know because now you have points of view from the audience, you have points of view from characters who maybe aren't even in the feature film. So I'm always looking for ways to let go of that single point of view. Uh, consider how you can show and not tell. You know that's a classic screenwriting thing, uh, but it's very important within you know within transmedia because you want somebody to experience something, you want them to feel it. You don't want to always be t having to tell them what they're supposed to be experiencing. Um, make it easy for your audience to become collaborators. In that example, the mobile application, I showed how it's very easy for them to actually become involved. Um, and you, you want to have very clear calls to action for your audience. 
You know, they, they want to be involved in some way. So help them, guide them, let them know that it's okay. And uh, you know, be welcoming with them. Um, and probably the most important one that I found is don't let the world get in the way of the story. You know, transmedia has a lot of bells and whistles, it has a lot of buzz to it, it has a, you know, don't let it be a checklist. It should really be stuff that supports the story. Because if you're true to the story, all the other things will fall into place. So, uh, one thing I wanted to share in closing with this particular presentation is I was approached to write a book about my experiences. And um, the publishing deal was horrible. Um, and so I said thanks, but no thanks. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to see if I just release this stuff for free, if I can beat the advance of the book. Um, and so it started kind of as a blog, and I was just sharing all this crazy stuff that I was cooking up. And then it started to catch on, and lo and behold, it ended up uh, four years later now, it's an open creative network that has you know, people working in all these disciplines in over 30 different countries and sharing the results, kind of like how I'm talking to you today and sharing these processes, because uh, in a new emerging entertainment space, you really have this opportunity where kind of the it's, it's almost like you're kind of pulling back the curtain and showing Oz. You know, for the longest time, entertainment was shrouded in like this hierarchy of like, you know, people controlled it, both from the production of it, the execution of it, the distribution of it, to also in, in terms of like the stories that were told. You know, if you were an audience, you sat there and it was like you, you know, it was this, uh, you know, this pristine kind of thing that was intended for you to see, which is fine, but you know, what is also really interesting at this point is that storytelling is becoming pervasive. It's, it's happening all over the place and it's happening in a variety of different creative disciplines. And so we have people in, in the space. So I highly recommend you check out the, the Workbook Project. There's a lot of really great insight there. It's very, very dense. There's a lot of stuff that's valuable. And, and we always say that if you ever want to share anything, you're more welcome to. It's a, it's a great way to give and, and, um, and uh, also share back if, if you so choose to do so. So um, that concludes this particular part of the session, which is about the story world. So if anybody has any questions. Sorry, did that book help? Be nice. Oh, yeah, that would help, right? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not Thank you. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's workbookproject.com. Uh, yes. Uh, the stories that I want to tell, you know, 
so it's kind of like the more you write, hopefully, the better you become at writing. You know, the more that I take the stories and experiment and release them to people, the more I can now start to hear or see or um, get a chance to reflect in them, reflect in a different way than I've ever been able to as a storyteller. So I think that that's probably the, the true passion. Of
I think it's because all the words are smaller. I mean, I, I, in some ways, I guess maybe like what I, what I can present out there is, is very ambitious, very large. But I think it can work for very small level things. So, like, a perfect example, and this goes to the um, when BP had their oil spill uh, in the Gulf, uh, somebody set up a, uh, a, a very simple Twitter account that was called BP um, Global PR. It wasn't actually BP, it was somebody who stepped in and actually acted as though they were PR for BP. And it was this very, like, kind of tongue in cheek kind of thing that was like shedding light on that particular situation. And um, I think it has maybe a quarter of a million followers. And they, what it did was they kept putting out these things that were like stories, you know, it's like 140 character stories. Um, and uh, it, it was um, something that worked well in terms of shedding light on it, but it was a very simple exercise. You know, they were able to voice a story through a social mechanism like that. Another example was, Twitter was uh, somebody took Ferris Bueller's Day Off, that movie, and they played it out over an eight hour period through Twitter and Facebook. You know, and every, you know, you got a timeline of where he was, and then they did the different characters and the intersections and stuff. And then that led to uh, the Chicago Travel Bureau doing um, a geolocational game around Ferris Bueller's Day Off within Chicago. So, I mean, I think there's ways that you can experiment with it that are very simple, and, and I think it can work with any kind of story. I think the thing to do is just kind of experiment with it. There's wonderful things that are just totally free and open. So those two examples have large audiences that they reach. Um, because the one thing that I want to make note of is I did um, an alternate reality game around the last film that actually was used as an R&D method for Hope is Missing. It was actually called Hope is Missing. Um, and I did it when uh, I released the movie to Warner Brothers and I knew that they would promote it. So I created a four week kind of uh, alternate reality game about uh, a guy whose fiance goes missing. Her name is Hope. But there was a double thing that it was the whole idea is Hope actually went missing and so forth and so on. But um, what was interesting about that is over the course of four weeks or so, two and a half million people were in there participating. It was like this electric, living, breathing audience. You know, like larger audience. Even though my films have been on HBO or Showtime and I see all this different stuff, larger audience and I could interact with them in real time. It was exhilarating, you know. So um, I think that that kind of thing is easy to experiment with, and you can just try it, and you can see if it works for a story that you have, and, and then kind of go from there. But back to that point of stories being underdeveloped, I think this is an excellent way to help develop stories. So I think it can work for any size. This is probably a question you, you probably should have heard the profile. Um, it seems kind of that you have a tantric approach to storytelling. It's a part of this a beginning and a middle, but there's no clear or unambiguous end. So the audience is kind of being robbed of the conclusion. So say I buy Wired magazine because I put a white page with it, but then you can know if you get the article online. Yeah. Because I like closing it over, I finished. You know, as I finished, and it's the same with every story beginning and end. How do you? What do you think the obstacles are going to be managing audiences' expectations of endings and conclusions? Um, and do you think? I mean, do you agree that you might be welcoming off conclusions? No, I mean, I mean, in certain respects, maybe. Um, but in terms of like the film feature film property has very clear conclusion. You know, the serialized content will have very clear conclusions. You know, so those elements will conclude. They'll have a beginning, middle, and end. It's the parts in between where hopefully I'm opening it up, and that's where the you know the open endedness comes. So like I want to deliver. Uh, you know, so like you're kind of having both ways. Trying to. Okay. You know, it's not to say like I use that glass metaphor purposely because you know it it, it can break. You know, like I, I don't mind if it breaks, and then I'll figure out what works and doesn't work. You know, but I, I think um, I think from my perspective, it's you know the the script and the scripts that we're writing and have written have very clear beginning, middles, and ends. They might pose questions at the end, but they have a conclusion, you know, and hopefully a satisfying conclusion. And then the, the second one is more related to, to games. And um, I feel.
what do you see as being maybe some of the steps that gaming can take in order to access those uh, that emotional range? Well, I think some of it uh, depends on the game. You know, like console games, I think are very limited. You know, computer games to a certain extent. But some of the urban games that I've seen and some of the social games are, are much richer because they actually involve more of an interaction and less of a like such a derivative path. You know, like I think sometimes video games fall under, you know, like they design it like the idea of the golden path. You know, like they, they know that you're gonna go down that corridor and percentage wise, 90% of people can go through that door on the right. You know, so they build for a certain way because it's a monolithic kind of build. And, and what they tease with is some of the most emotional moments or when you put them in control and there's a cut scene that they're trying to yeah. in between and that's where the emotion comes in. It's not with this, but there's a whole movement in like independent games where people are playing, like Jason Moore is playing with like these games where you, you, know, you pose these really heavy philosophical questions or, or, or very core like emotional type games and he plays off of the idea of 8-bit graphics. You know, he goes back to a really simple graphic thing and, but he does it on purpose. So then all of a sudden you're really kind of faced with like the fact of like, he has this one really great passage of time game where like two people are kind of going like this through time and you realize that one is, one is being born and the other is dying, you know, and like these really, really powerful kind of thematics. From it. But um, I, think, I think it's like if games are kind of like near the jazz singer and transmedia is like your silent film, you know, it's like somewhere there, you know, like they're getting to the point of where hopefully they're telling stories. Like, um, what was it, Heavy Rain is, is more effectively moving from the console game side to a, a more of an emotional storytelling. And you're seeing more uh, screenwriters move into games and stuff. But I think some of it's inherent to the form, the control, like how, how the platform does the game. And then you see interesting things where as gaming confines change in terms of like the way that you interact with the controller to now where you stand up with a Wii and you start to become more physically active, some of those things start to free it a little bit, you know, so. But games for me is a very wide category. Like a lot of people just naturally go to console games because it's a very big industry, but uh, some, you know, there's really great uh, things that can be done just with like social play. You know, that they, they, they have some of those cores that are found in the core, uh, within various console games, you know, like the rewards, the status, the, the, the game mechanics that you find there, but they do it more in a, in a more of a social context. So, so hopefully that answers those two questions. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. So what we are experimenting with in this particular incarnation is like an element of saying, okay, here, here it is to a certain level. And we've established this world and hopefully it's rich enough and it's dynamic enough that it will encourage them to contribute back in a way that's similar. It's never gonna necessarily be at the same level. You know, it might not be at the same level in terms of the quality of the writing or if somebody acts in something or, or the resources that they have in order to execute it. But you know the, the concept being that it's a matter of personally letting go and saying, okay, to a certain extent, I'm willing to kind of con control certain aspects of this, and then at other points, I'm okay with whatever they're going to push back with. And, and I guess I come back to that glass metaphor, you know, because it, it will break, you know. And, and some of those things with are all the nests that people make going to be amazing? No, some of them will be crap, you know, but. But, uh, but I guess in terms of the design, I find that balance of where I kind of, um, I'm okay with it. You know, like I find it. It's creating where it's supposed to be releasing, right? So it's actually creating a look mm -hmm. and an expectation yeah. before the thing comes. Right, right. So, you know, that, that's what I'm interested in. How, did, how does that dynamic work? How does that influence what you do? I mean, from the platform point of view, somebody mm -hmm. you, you can see sometimes doing something amazing. How does that? Right. 
terms of the balance you can yeah. like in terms of like that's an amazing aspect that somebody's done and that would be really great to incorporate in somewhere within the build. I mean, from the one side, the feature film kind of works as its own standalone, and the mobile stuff works as its own standalone, but all of it is intended to be kind of an R&D effort, which then gets into really interesting kind of intellectual property conversations and like the, you know, the idea of uh, you know, participatory culture and what people are helping build certain aspects of what effectively will be that third film. How does that third film work? So, I mean, some of those things I, I, I don't inherently have immediate answers for because we're at a point where we haven't really done it. I have ideas of how I'd like to try it. You know, I have ideas of what I'd like to do with that third film and how that film really kind of comes full from them, yeah. you know, in some way. You know, But, I mean, a lot of that will depend on, you know, the first film and, uh, and the build of everything else. But, yeah, I think it just really depends. But uh, I mean, I can see it on the negative side too, where, okay, we built this really rich world, and, and now you start to have things that are in the same world that are uh, much lower quality, and people's perceptions of what you're doing come from that. But that's all. Yeah. Well, and also the way that we filter it. Like, the, the first thing is an app, which in some instances they're not really fully familiar with the full story yet. You know, so we kind of piece things out and release things in a certain way. Um, So there's like this total transition right now. So I would even argue on the traditional side, there's not even a uniform, steady way to do it anymore. So we're kind of you know, you know, looking at what's advantageous in terms of a project by project basis. So um, it hasn't standardized enough to be a certain set way every time. 
but certain things borrow from traditional conventions where they work, and other things start are kind of innovating um, and looking at different models. When I showed that pyramid before and it had the 5%, yesterday I talked about where I think some of the future business models are going to come from. They're going to come from those people who become really engaged in what you do. And the audience that I'm building, arguably 50,000 in a closed beta, becomes a valuable asset. You know, they become a distribution asset, they become a promotion and marketing asset. But they also become collaborators in ways that if I harness fan fiction from them, I harness designs from them that we can mutually benefit from that. So maybe somebody designs an amazing like t-shirt or something that maybe an actor wears, and then I go and I you know sell that in some way, and then I split back royalties to them. So I think that there's all kinds of really exciting models. We realize that the audience isn't necessarily just have to be passive in the relationship. So I think to answer your question, even some of the models and some of the stuff we do even goes to that point where it goes totally direct to audience. Funds itself directly from audience, so it's it's a case by case basis. I have a question in three ways, and at the year start of the project, do you do you start with characters, like you you deploy each storyline with the characters, and is that your starting point, or do you start with a a vehicle project? It really depends on the project. You know, sometimes it might start with like an image that I see somewhere, or a location, or my thought to the location that character will come in and inhabit that. Other projects are like driven, uh, driven solely by a plot. It just depends. Like the television for uh, the television stuff I'm doing right now um, was driven very much by character. The film was driven by a mixture of plot and then character. You know, like the setting of this world and like playing in this fantasy of what this would be like and what the adults become. And then that kind of led to them, like, okay, now I know the setting. What kind of characters would have had in that? So it really just, it really just depends. It's on a case per case basis. Oh, cool, then I hit the mark. <laughs> <laughs>